بالحضور جميعا اهلا وسهلا فيكم بالندوه الحواريه حول موضوع المصادقه على الاتفاقيه الدوليه لحمايه جميع الاشخاص من الاختفاء القسري برحب فيكم بالنيابه عن المكتب الاقليمي للمفوضيه الساميه لحول الانسان من منطقه الشرق الاوسط وشمال افريقيا رح نبدا مع الكلمات الافتتاحيه مع حضرة الدكتور زياد عاشور يلي هو نائب رئيس الهيئة الوطنية للمفقودين والمخفيين قصرا بلبنان. تفضل استاذ زياد. مرحبا يعطيكم العافية. بداية هلو فيرست in the name of Judge Salim Osta, President of the Commission and the members of the Commission, we would like to thank you for inviting us to take part in this uh, uh, webinar and we hope that the participation of uh, the, uh, the, um, the National Commission for the Missing and Forcibly Disappeared in Lebanon in this uh, webinar uh, is the start of the participation of all stakeholders in this issue, very critical issue, uh, that we would like uh, to welcome. First, it is very difficult to speak about any topic without going back to our reality, not on the basis of uh, the mere reality, but uh, in an attempt to make a relationship between the crisis we are living today in Lebanon and the situation. And here we're talking about the economic and social unprecedented crisis, uh, and uh, as everybody's saying in the uh, since the 19th century, and uh, we believe uh, that uh, this is a crisis uh, of, uh, of, uh, of bread and uh, and staying alive. And I believe that uh, the issue of the enforced uh, disappearance uh, is not related to this, uh, to this reality or is not a priority today. But uh, this is a very naive analysis, uh, however, because uh, the harsh situation we are living today is uh, uh, directly linked to, uh, to uh, putting aside uh, the rights uh, of all those disappeared people and uh, their parents. And uh, what we mean by that is the failure of uh, this state of law and uh, the state that is based on justice and human rights and the implementation of laws. And uh, this policy that we are following today and uh, and. Uh, this uh, policy is sh and the solution should be to stop accepting the situation and uh, to start tackling the rights of those disappeared uh, people, the right to know the, uh, the circumstances uh, of the fate of the disappeared is a natural is a natural right for the parents of those disappeared and does not accept any exemption and nobody has the right whether the authority or the government to have uh, to behave in this way and so this is a sine qua non right, whether we're talking about the international conventions, including the International Convention for the Protection of All Persons from Enforced Disappearance in Lebanon, which is the topic of our meeting today. Consequently, this natural law and this natural right is based on human rights. However, everybody has the role uh, to a play and after civil the civil uh, the civil uh, uh, war in Lebanon we had the Taif agreement and we have uh, the constitution amended however the reconstruction of the state that is the state of laws we can we can't Mr. Michel Moussa please turn off your mic 
à Mr. Michel Moussa. Docteur Michel, Excuse us, Dr. Ashour. Would you please open your camera? Activate your camera, Dr. Ashour. We can't see you, however. Please, go ahead. I was saying, in uh, this critical period of Lebanon's history, the state of law was uh, put aside and the principles of law were uh, uh, were put aside and we went against nature and the result was the authority and the, this, uh, the government that we have today and uh, that is the cause of all our ailments and suffering and uh, because of all what we've been through and all the circumstances, uh, I believe that uh, we, uh, we are here today. So, um, after civil after the civil war uh, nothing was done uh, to uh, to cater for the rights of uh, the disappeared and especially the right to know the fate of the disappeared persons uh, we are very far away from the state of law and the state of uh, rights and that is based on the institutions and above all the free uh, the free judiciary and today as we can see uh, all these rights have been forgotten what is i'm trying to say is that the uh, uh, the issue of the disappeared is critical and vital in the uh, in the reconstruction and the regaining the rights it is a priority in reconstruction the state of uh, law and the state of rights and we should not um uh, we should not forget these rights because this is uh, this is a main component of uh, the of reconstruction of reconstructing the state of law and if we want to uh, reconstruct and rebuild the second uh, repu republic, we need to tackle the issue of the disappeared persons. On another hand, the struggle continued despite all uh, obstacles, and we, we should really salute the struggle of uh, the parents of the disappeared persons, and clearly those persons are following the issue this issue and they are trying to put things in place they are trying to put on the right track the relationship between the citizens and the government and by that the article um, the law 218 um, paved the way for the creation of the committee for uh, the, the National Commission for the Missing and Forcibly Disappeared in Lebanon. We hope that our work um, is fruitful and we hope also to, uh, to that the Lebanese government ratifies the International Convention for the Protection of All Persons for Enforced that, that is complementary with the Article 105 and the priorities of the National Com Commission and we would like to affirm as well that the priority of the Commission is also uh, to is complementary with the Convention, however, Article 105 uh, does not replace the mechanisms and the uh, committees emerging from the Convention, and we hope that we tackle this issue as well, because unfortunately, the authority in Lebanon knows very well how to use uh, these uh, and how to circumvent uh, the issue and use uh, these approaches whereby they say that we have a national commission and consequently there is uh, no need to ratify the international convention for the protection of all persons from enforced disappearance and this is also goes in line with the issue of uh, combating uh, violence and combating uh, uh, com combating uh, torture and uh, especially in the report of uh, that were submitted to, to the international commissions of human laws and uh, 
and they used also the same pretext that we have a commission against torture and th there's no need to ratify the International Convention Against Torture. That is why the National Commission does not replace uh, this convention because they are both complementary, however uh, different. And ratifying international convention, whether in uh, uh, those related to human rights, uh, is the clear way and the straight way in order to 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 be on the right path to towards uh, human rights uh, protection, especially when it comes to the Convention on the protection of all persons from enforced disappearance. And we would like to reiterate the importance of uh, in of ratifying this uh, international convention so that it becomes uh, complementary with the mandate of uh, the Commission and with Article 105 over 2018. And based on that, the, uh, the National Commission welcomes this uh, virtual webinar uh, um, that is organized by the Office of the High Commission, Commissioner for Human Rights, with, uh, along with all our partners. And we would like to thank you all. And we would like also to commend the uh, invitation, uh, our inv uh, invitation, inviting us to participate in this uh, webinar because uh, although the International Convention for the Protection for, of All Persons from Enforced Disappearance uh, is, uh, is uh, essential, and even if uh, this convention today is not, uh, is not binding, however, for the Commission, it will be a guiding, it will uh, hold it will be as guiding principles, as especially that we are still at the the beginning of uh, our work. We are still uh, we are still having our uh, our found. Uh, we are still drafting our foundation, and especially that all principles of this uh, commission be in line with international standards. And that is why. And even if this convention is not a binding convention, it is. It will guide us in our work, and it will guide us in the implementation of the uh, the articles and the laws in that are applied in Lebanon. We hope that discuss, discussing this uh, convention would be objective and uh, transparent, especially in view of the uh, the um, the approach of uh, the authority in Lebanon. In addition, and in this uh, opportunity, in this event, we consider that there is space for discussing the, um, the establishment of this commission and to reiterate that the National Commission for the Missing and Forcibly Disappeared in Lebanon has a, uh, has a strong ground despite all the difficulties uh, that it is uh, facing, especially in light of uh, not uh, uh, having, uh, not adopting uh, or, uh, a budget for this commission and all delays in appointing the members, uh, the independent, the four independent members of uh, this uh, commission mission knowing that uh, the uh, the chairman uh, or the president of uh, this uh, commission informed the concerned parties and uh, communicated with the ministry of justice and uh, uh, recently the minister of justice was informed about the importance of appointing the members and he promised us that uh, this will be done uh, soon finally i would like to reiterate uh, my uh, thank to all stakeholders supporting uh, our work and I would also like to convey my thanks, the thanks of uh, and the gratitude of the President Salim Osta and all members of the uh, committee of the Commission and their gratitude to, to this uh, webinar. And we wish you a fruitful and success uh, to this uh, to this uh, webinar. And thank you once again for inviting us. Thank you once again, Dr. Ziyad, for all this information. Now I would like to welcome uh, the, um, His Excellency Deputy Michel Moussa, the Chairman of the Human Rights Committee of the Lebanese Parliament. The floor is yours. Please uh, activate your mic. Would you please activate your mic, please?
Can you hear me now? Dr. Ashur, would you please turn off your mic? Can you hear me now? Yes, please. Go ahead. We can hear you. Yes, clearly. Yes, we can see you and hear you. Hello. Apologies for this technical glitch. Ladies and gentlemen, before before starting or tackling our uh, main topic today, allow me first to thank uh, the Office of High Commissioner for the Human Rights for giving me the opportunity as uh, the Chairman of the Human Rights Committee of the Lebanese Parliament to participate in this uh, webinar and uh, for insisting on my participation. And uh, thank you uh, for the uh, Office for supporting all issues related to human rights in Lebanon. As it is well known, the uh, civil war in Lebanon 1975-1990 led to catastrophic results at the human and economic levels where it left around 41,000 people missing or uh, who were killed and more than 144,000 people uh, persons killed. Ladies and gentlemen, tackling the past and facing this past is vital, a vital sector and it is our duty in order to provide a safe and, and sustainable future for future generations. Consequently, and given our responsibility, the responsibility we assume, I would like to assure you our full support in this issue and following up all its details at the legislative level in the parliamentary committees. Historically, the, um, the work and the struggle of the parents of those uh, disappeared and their patience and their natural clinging to this cause resulted in the, um, the uh, promulgation of Law 105 that were issued in 2018 and the creation of the National Commission in 2020. And from this platform and forum, we would like to ask everybody not to lose hope and despite that Lebanon has been suffering from several crises, uh, the, uh, um, the human rights remain a priority that can be uh, forgotten. The promulgation of law is uh, the ratification and is the assurance of uh, the uh, authorities uh, to reveal the truth and the consecration of uh, this cause. And along that, uh, there are also the duties and obligations to follow up on this important cause. Lebanon has ratified the Convention of the Protection of persons from enforced disappearance in 2007. Still, it's, it still hasn't ratified it. And by signing it, this proves that it is, it holds responsible, it is responsible to, uh, to, um, to find the truth. And as a chairman of the Human Rights Committee, I would like to reiterate our, um, our, uh, uh, our reassurance that all international conventions for human rights uh, have been the way uh, to um, to reveal the truth and you all know that uh, the obstacles in Lebanon are mainly political uh, political uh, conflicts and uh, religious conflicts. Uh, however, we should not uh, surrender because together we can we can uh, uh, reach our objectives uh, at the level of uh, human rights and protecting and achieving human rights. As uh, to the ratification of international convention, I believe that uh, this is a political issue and uh, it has been a political issue especially when it comes and there are uh, several draft laws that, that have been submitted by the cabinet to the parliament. However, these have not been uh, ratified yet. However, it is not, uh, the issue is not related only to this convention because there are other causes and other conventions uh, and among these, uh, the convention related to the rights of this disabled in Lebanon and this is a permanent cause that is being submitted to the 
uh, to the government uh, from the Lebanese government to the Syrian government and it is still uh, it is still t stuck however we will continue our fight and we hope that with a new, this a new cabinet and as you may all know that uh, in Lebanon we have had these voids and the difficulty in formation of uh, the um, the successive uh, cabinets we hope that with this new government we will be able to come out to a solution in order to be able to ratify the international convention for the protection uh, of all persons ladies and gentlemen the um, uh, the um the justice is vital to know the fate of those uh, of, uh, the fate of the disappeared persons the the ratification of and the implementation of the International Convention for the Protection of All Persons from Enforced Disappearance is vital to um, to combat impunity for the uh, crimes uh, of enforced disappearances and to uh, to reveal the truth about the circumstances and the fate of the disappeared person and also uh, the rights of victims and justice uh, to justice and reparation because because until today uh, before before the application of this convention there were no uh, no uh, um, no binding uh, uh, conventions that is why we reassure our the importance of ratifying this convention ladies and gentlemen the right to uh, to dignity and uh, and the right to to non, not being a victim to torture and the right to a just uh, a trial as long as as well as other rights uh, are uh, the main main rights in building democracy and based on that i would like to reiterate and affirm that uh, we are seeking to promote uh, human rights and uh, the principle and basic rights effectively and and to implement uh, all uh, declarations and the covenants related uh, to human rights and I would like to affirm again our engagement to follow up uh, this cause uh, with you and uh, with uh, all concerned authorities, especially uh, given the uh, the critical the critical aspect of uh, the uh, enforced disappearance issue. Thank you, Dr. Musa, for all these uh, important information. I would like to give the floor now to Ms. Ruwaid Al Hajj, the regional representative of the Office of the High Commissioner for the Human Rights in the. Middle East region and North Africa. Thank you, Ms. Lean, and uh, thank you, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. the Minister, and uh, the uh, uh, Your Excellency, Mr. Michel Moussa, Mr. Ziad Ashour, uh, uh, Mrs. Dagher, and uh, Mrs. Ayman, I mean, Mr. Ayman Dah uh, Ahmed. Uh, members uh, of uh, the UN uh, Committee on Enforced Disappearance, uh, dear colleagues from the International Red Cross uh, Committee, and uh, dear uh, national institutions on human rights, uh, dear colleagues from Jordan, Lebanon, uh, dear uh, diplomats, uh, dear experts, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to salute you, and I would like to salute uh, the uh, families of uh, the four forcibly disappeared uh, persons. You know, the regional office of the OHCHR uh, will be having a very brief presentation because I want to give the floor to the members of uh, the uh, commission and I would like to give the floor also to the representatives of the Ministry of Justice. I want uh, this uh, discussion to be very fruitful. So we are deploying efforts uh, in the field of enforced disappearance in coordination with our General Secretariat and the specialized institutions of uh, the United Nations, including the agencies present in Lebanon, in cooperation, of course, with the civil society, the Lebanese authorities, and universities in Lebanon, without uh, forgetting the families of victims. And we have organized uh, many sessions uh, and uh, workshops, uh, especially with Lebanese universities, uh, in order to pave the way for the 
ratification of uh, the uh, convention and uh, about uh, the adoption of law number 105 of year 2018. Enforced disappearance uh, is one of the most serious crimes and uh, this uh, practice uh, whenever it is committed uh, systematically uh, becomes uh, a crime against humanity as stipulated uh, by the convention and uh, we need uh, to uh, protect people uh, from enforced disappearance. Uh, this uh, would be a victory for victims. Uh, this would limit uh, the spread of this crime. This would also allow for the payment of reparation and this would also give more credibility to the Lebanese state. I would like to welcome you again in this encounter and I wish you a fruitful discussion. I give you the floor, Mrs. Leonid. Thank you, Mrs. Rueda. I would like to thank you for your clarifications. I would like uh, to show you a very short video that was prepared by the regional office of uh, the uh, Office of the High Commissioner of Human Rights. Uh, this is a video about a call for the ratification of the International Convention for the Protection of All Persons Against Enforced Disappearance. Uh, there have been cases of uh, abduction and disappearances in Lebanon. There are people whose fate is still unknown. Uh, we have missing and forcibly disappeared persons in Lebanon. Enforced disappearance is a serious violation of human rights. It's a crime and an offense according to the human rights international law. Many... Uh, conventions uh, have been signed uh, by Lebanon. However, Lebanon uh, did not ratify the International Convention for the Protection of All Persons Against Enforced Disappearance. The Parliament adopted law number 105 in 2018 for the creation of a national commission for the missing and forcibly disappeared in Lebanon in order uh, to uh, inquire about the fate of those people. And the law number 105 uh, gave uh, the uh, members of the community the right to know about the fate of the missing people. There will be no reconciliation unless uh, justice is administered. And we need to enforce Law 105 and support uh, the work of the National Commission, ratify the International Convention on Enforced Disappearance. Thank you very much. I would like uh, to welcome uh, Mrs. Uh, Carmen Rosa uh, Villa. She is uh, the chair of the United Nations Committee on Enforced Disappearances. Uh, Mrs. Carmen Rosa Villa will talk about uh, the importance of this uh, convention for all countries of uh, the world. And uh, she will talk uh, about uh, the mechanisms and importance of joining this international instrument. Mrs. Uh, Carmen, you have the floor. Good morning, everybody. I'm in the South America, in Lima, Peru. Excellencies and distinguished participants, dear colleagues, thanks to OSCHR office for inviting us to participate in this virtual conference to highlight the most relevant aspect of the International Convention for Protection of All Persons from Enforced Disappearances. Together with my colleague, Milica Kolakovic and Juan Pablo Albán, member of the board of the Committee on Enforced Disappearances, I'm pleased to participate in this conference. Enforced disappearances are not only a problem of the past. Regrettably, today 
they continue to be a practice that practically covers the entire universal geographic and all social and political segments. Hundreds of thousands of people have disappeared and continue to disappear, and in some contexts, it is increasing, such as during the migration, human trafficking, and the pandemic of COVID-19. In this context, women and children are in a situation of vulnerability and in many cases also become victims of enforced disappearances, sexual violence, and other type of violence. Why is so important to ratify the Convention? The Convention for the Protection of All Persons from Enforced Disappearances is the first universally binding human rights instrument on enforced disappearances, filing a legal gap in international human rights law that hindered the effective protection of all persons from this crime. Becoming parties to the conventions, states show their support for the victims of enforced disappearances worldwide, who have been struggling over the past 40 years to achieve this option of this treaty. The convention is an instrument of support for states and victims. Its committee, the monetary body of the convention, has its main mandate to support the states and their authorities in preventing enforced disappearances and combating impunity in this field. Until the Convention is ratified, the Committee on Enforced Disappearances does not have the competence to intervene regarding in a country so it cannot support victims, civil society organizations that support them, the national human rights institutions, and state institutions to fight against enforced disappearances as it could do if the, if the country had ratified that convention. The convention represents a milestone in preventing and combating enforced disappearances. First, recognize the autonomous right of every person not to be subject to enforced disappearances. Second, recognize that any person who has suffered harm as a direct result of unenforced disappearances is a victim of such an act. It established a series of measures that the state must adopt to prevent and eradicate enforced disappearances and address the terrible effects of its crime on individuals. The Convention provides the most comprehensive international legal framework to fight against enforced disappearances. Indeed, as in the case of other human rights treaties, the Convention for the Protection of All Persons Against Enforced Disappearances only apply to a state that have ratified it. The need that the Convention be ratified to be applicable makes it a strong instrument to the ratification, a state commit to respect the principles of the convention. Through ratification, a state officially demonstrate their commitment to contribute to eradicate and preventing this crime and confirm that they are ready to work together with the committee to, do, to this end. This may be seen an, as an obvious objective, but unfortunately, this is not the case. Such commitment remains far too rare as only 64 of the 193 member states of the United Nations have ratified the convention today. I just wanted to let you know that this situation is of concern. First, 
it limits the possibility for the committee to perform its mandate. Second, it seems to indicate a lack of involvement of the state to eradicate and prevent enforced disappearances. Of course, we all know that such an impression cannot be generalized. Nevertheless, this impression is very often shared in the discussion related to the low level of ratification of the convention. There are three aspects of the convention that I would like to highlight as follow. First, the convention is a guiding instrument to state authorities to identify measures to be taken, including legislative measures, to prevent, combat, and eradicate enforced disappearances, combat impunity of perpetrators, investigating and punish all acts of enforced disappearances, protect and guarantee the rights of victims, including the rights to truth and reparation. Second, the convention is an instrument of prevention. The convention has many relevant features of all the states, even those that do not have a history of enforced disappearances, to prevent their perpetration in a territory under jurisdiction. This includes the provision of secret detention, the right of persons deprived of their liberty to communicate with and be visited by any person of their choice and or by their consular authority in the case of the foreigners. non refoulement and the obligation to compile and maintain official records and or registers of persons deprived of their liberty shall be made promptly available to any judicial or other competent authorities upon request. Third, the convention is an instrument of the cooperation between states in the fight against enforced disappearances. It indeed provides mutual as legal assistance measures between state parties in connection with an offense of enforced disappearances. State parties shall cooperate with each other to assist victims of enforced disappearances in searching for locating and releasing disappeared person and in the event of that, in exhuming and identifying them and returning their remains. State parties shall also cooperate with each other in providing all evidence at their disposal to proceed to, search, to the search of a disappeared person and in supplying any information which could help to bring to trial the person suspect of having committed and enforced disappearances and if they are found guilty in punishing them. The guiding principles for search for disappeared person are an important and helpful guide to address obstacles to overcome bad practices and generally improve the search process in any state, whether or not it is a party to the convention. To sum up, the principles of the convention were defined based on the experiences and they were truly discussed and analyzed. Moreover, they were accepted as a basis by all member states who adopted the convention. Then, we all know that implementing the principle of the convention is a long process that cannot be achieved from one day to the other. The, committees, the committee is precisely here to support the competent authorities 
to identify the challenges and the measures that should be taken so that the rights and obligation of the Convention become a reality for all. The Committee on Enforced Disappearances is a monitoring body of the Convention. The Committee is the body that monitors the implementation of the International Convention by its state's party and was established under Article 26, Paragraph 1 of the Convention, term by the state parties of the Convention. Each member must be a national of a state party and high moral character and have recognized competence in the field of international human rights. By offering our expertise, its expertise on crimes of enforced disappearances, the member of the committee have as their main mandate to support states and their authorities in putting an end to this means of terror and combating impunity in this field. On 23rd December 2020, the Committee on Enforced Disappearances celebrate 10 years since the entry in force of the International Convention for the Protection of All Persons from Enforced Disappearances. Over the past 10 years, our committee has worked hard to support the state parties in implementing the Convention and victims, civil society organizations, national human rights institutions to prevent and eradicate enforced disappearances. Over the years, the committee has progressively built up its jurisprudence by examining initiatives and follow-up state reports requests for urgent actions and individual communications to eradicate and prevent enforced disappearances require the effort of the whole world. And we need more states to ratify the convention. Furthermore, the prevent similar violations in the future in all parts of the world. This is a fundamental aim of the Convention. To sign the Convention, as Lebanon did, is a positive step, but nevertheless does not provide any competence to the Committee. In that connection, I would like to remind you that in the context of the UPR, Lebanon has received various recommendations inviting the state to ratify, and Lebanon has accepted these recommendations. The committee offers its full support to the states to attend to any questions in that regard. Moreover, we hope that the instrument of ratification can soon be deposited before the Secretary General of the United Nations. Thank you very much for your kind attention for this session. Please do not hesitate to get in touch with us. Thank you. Uh, many thanks, uh, Ms. Carmen, for uh, this valuable intervention. So I would like now to welcome Mr. Juan Pablo Albain. Uh, he is a member of the Commission on Enforces Appearance. Um, the floor is yours, Mr. Juan. Thank you very much. Good morning for us. Um, uh, good afternoon for you. Uh, it's an honor to address you, Your Excellencies, dear colleagues, to briefly explain the methods of work that the committee employs in order to fulfill its mandate. As Carmen Rosa, our chair, had already explained, um, the committee is comprised of 10 experts uh, that basically have the duty to uh, accompany the states in fulfilling the obligations contained in the convention. To do so, the committee addresses both general situations and specific cases. The mandate of uh, the committee uh, comprises the examination of reports submitted by the states' parties and the measures taken to give effect to the, to the obligations under the convention. This according to Article 
29 of the convention, and I will explain further how we uh, examine the reports later on. But first, I will explain all the measures that we can take. Secondly, uh, we can send urgent action uh, requests to the state in order to um, adopt, for the state to adopt measures, including interim measures to locate and protect a disappeared person. Um, this according to Article 30 of the International Convention. We can also receive and consider communications from individuals claiming to be victims of a violation of a given right contained in the convention by a state party. This is according to Article 31 of the convention. We can receive and consider communications in which a state party to the convention claims that another state party to the convention is not fulfilling its obligations under uh, the treaty. This on, according to Article 32 of, of the convention. We can undertake visits to any state party after consultation with the state concerned. And during the visit and before the visit, we can receive information indicating that the state uh, could be violating uh, several provisions of the convention. This under Article 33. Actually, we are preparing the first visit of the committee um, during this first 10 years of activities of the committee. The committee had not carried out visits under Article 33. However, uh, after a uh, lengthy negotiation, finally, the Mexican government has uh, accepted the visit of the committee and we will carry out a visit from November 15 to November 27, which will be the first um, carried out by the committee. And finally, we can submit to the attention of the Secretary General of the United Nations well-founded indications that enforce disappearance is being practiced as a widespread or systematic crime in the territory under the jurisdiction of a given state party. This under Article 34 of uh, the Convention. I would like now to explain a bit further how we deal with general Um, guys, um, apparently, apparently, Mr. Juan Pablo is facing a technical issue. I'd like to invite all the attendees to um, to add their questions or interventions in the chat box, in the messages box. Please feel free to add there your suggestions, your questions to the experts who are with us today. Uh. I'm, I'm sorry, I don't know yes. what happened. Um, yes. My screen uh, froze. Spec but I, will continue. I was explaining uh, that the, the committee is not, in, uh, is not allowed to review per periodic reports by the state. And this is probably very important to point out because the committee has the duty to verify that the states are complying with the, uh, their obligations. However, in order to do so, what we do is that we receive an initial report um, on all the provisions of the treaty, on how the state is complying with them, and later on, we request information to follow up how the states are uh, complying with our recommendations and are assessing the aspects that, um, for us, were concerning aspects. And this is important to note because the states will not undertake the obligation to present reports every given number of years. Um, the follow-up to the concluding observations that we issue after the, uh, the, the initial report 
have to do with particular particular areas of concern for us. And um, what we expect is, is that the state will submit information on what additional measures it had it has decided to adopt in order to comply with those particular recommendations, usually three recommendations. Later on, uh, according to the provisions of the convention, the, the committee can request additional information on uh, past issues and also on new uh, problematic areas that we discovered through the information provided in general by uh, civil society organizations. So it is important to note that we don't have periodic reports and it is the only uh, treaty body monitoring the implementation of a given uh, treaty of the UN that uh, does not um, receive periodic reports. Um, I would also like to uh, present some additional information on, on the visits. When the, the committee receives information on grave violations to the convention, it will contact the state in order to ask the state to authorize a visit by the, by the committee. Of course, due to the nature of our activities, we will not impose the visit, the visit on the state, but the state will have to agree to the visit. Uh, these visits enable the committee to have a more direct contact with the reality in the country and to obtain more elements to provide useful assistance to the state on how to implement the convention and how to comply with the recommendations issued by the um, committee during the uh, examination of, of the state reports. And the, the visits are not... Um, conceived as a mechanism to put pressure on the state, but rather as a cooperation mechanism uh, to, um, to have a better dialogue in order to fulfill the obligations under the convention. Um, and finally, I would also like to mention um, two specific aspects of our work in um, in, in cases, in a specific situations, not general situations, which are the urgent actions and the individual complaints. An urgent action, as I explained before, is a request submitted by the committee to the state in order to search, locate, and protect a disappeared person and to investigate the disappearance. This is under Article 30 of the Convention. This request uh, could be submitted after a petition is presented to the committee by the relatives of the disappeared person or the legal representatives um, or any other person that has a legitimate interest in the um, whereabouts of the disappeared person. Um, of course, it is expected that first the interested party will present the uh, request to search, locate, and protect the person di directly to the government, but if it is not possible or if uh, it has been presented but the government has not reacted to that petition, then um, they can come to us and request an urgent action. So I wanted to, uh, to address the question of individual complaints. As I mentioned under Article 31 of the Convention, any individual claiming to be the victim of a violation of a right protected by the Convention can submit a complaint, what is, is called uh, by other committees a communication. Uh, so the individual communication or complaint procedure only applies to those state parties that have made a specific declaration accepting the competence of the committee to examine individual complaints under, under Article 31. And this declaration can be made, and we hope that Lebanon will make it when the state becomes a party to the International Convention or any time afterwards. Um, the individual complaint is a, sort of a last resort once the victims have exhausted all domestic remedies in order to protect their rights under the Convention. And the decision that we issue under uh, this particular procedure is a quasi-judicial quasi decision that has a binding effect on the state. Um, and we will recommend the specific reparations that should be provided to the victim in the particular case, uh, depending on the rights that have been violated. Finally, I would uh, briefly 
like to also refer to something that Carmen Rosa in her presentation already mentioned, which are the guiding principles for the search of the disappeared. And this, this is a very useful instrument. I think for the National Commission in Lebanon, this would be very useful to adopt a national policy on, um, on the search of, of the disappeared modeled on these uh, guiding principles. The guiding principles were, were adopted in April 2019 and they seek to consolidate good practices in searching effectively for disappeared persons. And uh, they have been developed on the basis of the accumulated um, experience of the committee in, their, uh, in the first years of, of work of the committee, and particularly on the accumu accumulated experience under Articles 29 and, thir and 30, meaning uh, examination of reports and urgent actions. The guiding principles uh, address the question on how the search should be conducted uh, respecting human dignity, how there should be a public policy in place in order to search for the disappearances, how disappearances uh, should be addressed with a differ differential approach, considering the particularities of the victim, uh, how families should participate in search processes, how the search should start without delay, um, how until you find the disappeared person, the state has a uh, continued obligation on searching the, 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 the disappeared and um, how the, the, the search efforts should follow a comprehensive strategy uh, that basically should um, uh, end with, a, you know, an efficient effort, a coordinated effort, an appropriate effort to uh, actually find the disappeared person. So I think this is a very important instrument that also the government should take into account, even uh, while you are considering ratifying the convention, uh, you can start using these guiding principles. And some states that are not parties to the convention yet are already um, using these guiding principles as uh, a reference on how to conduct uh, search efforts for disappeared persons. Uh, that would be my presentation, and I'm open for any questions later on. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Juan Pablo, for this uh, valuable intervention and also for all these uh, information about the instruments in place and that the member states can use and also the national commissions can make use of it uh, in their search for the missing and disappeared persons. Um, now we have a, a question uh, from Ms. Carmen Abu Jaudi. She is uh, the member of the National Commission on Enforced Disappearance in Lebanon. She is asking Mr. Carmen Rosa about, you know, the number of states who ratified the convention so far. So um, in your presentation, Ms. Carmen, you mentioned the number. Or maybe Mr. Juan Pablo can answer this question. Yes, I mentioned in that. Uh, yes, right now, um, as of 64 today, 64 states ratified, states ratified, the, ratified convention. The, the convention. Sorry, Carmen Rosa, go on. No, don't, don't worry. <laughs> 64 states ratified the convention, and we try to have more and more states to ratify the signatures that we have. It's 47 states uh, signed the, the convention, but they didn't already ratify the convention. That's why uh, Argentina and France have a big campaign in order to uh, uh, call all the states to ratify the convention. U universality is very important and that's why this event is very useful, o not only for you, but only for all members of the, of the world that could ratify the convention. This is important because the, the, the convention gives you an authority and victims a really, really good instrument to fight against impunity and, of course, to eradicate the enforced disappearances. Thank you very much, Mr. Carmen Rosa. Uh, we have another question from Mr. Saad Shatila to MP Michel Moussa. Uh, says, Michel, 
عم يسالك الاستاذ سعد الدين عن موضوع مجموعه الامم المتحده مجموعه الدين مستر سعد الدين از اسكينج يو اون ذا وركينج جروب اوف ذا كوميتي that asked for a visit to Lebanon in 2015, but Lebanon has not agreed on that visit to date. So uh, we we are asking whether you have any follow-up or updates on this uh, request to visit Lebanon, to visit the committee, or uh, on uh, any other updates related to the special rapporteur um, related to the um, depend the independence of uh, lawyers and judges and their visits uh, mr michel is muted can you hear me now yes we can hear you i do not have any information on this uh, issue But uh, all I know is that all the UN agencies are taking uh, appointments uh, with us and they are actually visiting us and uh, coming over to Lebanon. But I can follow up on this. I will follow up and uh, I will see why is there a delay in giving them appointments uh, for meetings. And I hope it's not all about political reasons or uh, related to the delay in the formation of the government in the past months. Uh, but all I know is that all, on, when it comes to all the different issues, um, as far as I know, no one is asking us for appointments or for visits that we are not uh, giving them uh, appointments, especially that a lot of organizations are uh, able to uh, visit us. Um, and this is also part of the convention So on this issue in particular, I do not have enough updates. Uh, but as I said, everyone requesting a visit is granted a visit. I will follow up on this. Colleagues uh, from the CED, uh, what what are the uh, what are the reservations that uh, 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 the state members that have, uh, presented to the committee or ratified, you know, uh, the convention based on it? And uh, do you think that these reservations are true? This question is addressed uh, to the UN Commission. However, we have to bear in mind that this is a human rights treaty. This means that the core provisions of the treaty, of course, cannot be subject to reservations. Um, some states have issued reservations. In practice, they have not curtailed the possibility of the committee to supervise the implementation of obligations under Article, um, under Article 29, receiving peri periodic reports. And... Um, uh, In general, there are no reservations that could um, actually block the committee's possibility to request urgent actions, for instance. What has happened, uh, indeed, is that many have not decided to authorize expressly the committee by um, recognizing its competence to receive individual complaints. But I, I would insist it, it has to be taken into account that this is a human rights treaty and that core provisions of the treaty cannot be uh, subject to reservations because otherwise the effect util of the treaty uh, would, 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 would not be complied with, right? So um, we hope that when once Lebanon ratifies the convention, it will do so without any sort of reservations. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Juan. Uh, we have another question, please, from uh, Mr. El Haj Ahmed. Um, Mr. El Haj Ahmed uh, is saying that uh, don't you think that I mean uh, uh, not acknowledging the mandate of the committee in receiving and uh, following up on individual complaint according to Article 31 of the Convention um, is not really appropriate. Mr. Juan or Ms. Carmen? 
Well, as I, as I explained before, the committee has uh, different tools. So even if the state decides not to recognize the competence of the committee to receive individual complaints, the committee will still have the possibility to address specific cases through its urgent actions uh, mechanism. And furthermore, um, also, if there is a pattern, if there is a, the, this systematic or generalized practice of enforced disappearances, the committee also has other mechanisms to address the situation, like um, requesting the state to authorize a visit or like submitting the matter to the attention of the secretary general, which in turn will submit the matter to the attention of the General Assembly. So uh, I think the versatility of the committee is based mostly on the different mechanisms that we can uh, use in order to address situations. But of course, the ideal uh, scenario is that the state will accept the competence of the committee to receive individual complaints. Uh, thank you. I would like to add something very important through the urgent actions the committee requests to a state party to provide investigation of any action taken to search for the disappeared person and investigate the alleged disappears some evidence, patterns, and the importance of a strategic or, or the investigation, the plan that we need to prepare by the state. In many cases, for example, family members uh, have not been informed of any measures taken by the authority in charge of search investigation. That is very important, is in relation with the urgent actions. Uh, it's important that the state authority, that uh, they need to, to, to take all measures, for example, to, to coordinate between different institutions and um, they are responsible for searching for missing persons and investigating their enforced disappearances to issue regular uh, and transparent report on the progress made during this kind of urgent action. This is a part of the, the requesting that we usually have during the uh, urgent action process. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Carmen. Uh, for your answer. And we have another question, please, from Ms. Carmen Abu Jaude. Also, she is uh, the member of the National Commission on Enforces Appearance in Lebanon. She is asking you and Mr. Juan Pablo um, how the committee can help the National Commission despite the fact that, Le that Lebanon did not ratify yet the, the convention. Well, it, it is important to note that uh, until Lebanon has ratified the convention, the committee has no specific competence to address the situation of enforced disappearances in Lebanon. However, it is also important to note that there's another um, body, monitoring body, uh, which is the special procedure of the Human Rights Council, the Working Group on Enforced or Involuntary Disappearances, which coexists with the committee and cooperates with the states in their fight against enforced disappearances precisely in, uh, in those situations where the states are not uh, parties to the International Convention on Enforced Disappearances. So I would say that um, while, as I mentioned before, Lebanon could uh, use as, as, as a basic reference on the national policy to address the situation of the disappeared, the guiding principles issued by the, by the committee. And of course, the committee is open to have conversations like this uh, with the state. Uh, if, if, the, if the state is not a party to the convention, then probably the, the dynamic of the, of the exchange and the conversation would be better with the working group, uh, which, which actually addresses the situation for those countries that are not parties to the convention. Thank you very much, Mr. Juan Pablo. Ms. Carmen, do you have anything to add? No, thank you very much for inviting us. This is very important conference, virtual conference. And we have, we are an 
in, in your disposition to to help you and to give you some other information. And I think this is a really good opportunity to call, to recall uh, to Lebanon to ratify the convention and in, 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 the, in the way that they did it when they approved and they accepted the recommendation made by the UPR during the, uh, the, third, the second and the third session. And thank you very much for this opportunity. And again, I give you my all uh, support to do, it, to, to do this. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Carmen. Uh... Uh, I have also another question from Ms. Carmen Abu Jaudeh as well. Uh, th this question is addressed to uh, Mr. Michel Moussa. So, uh, Ms. Carmen, I'm told, uh, Dr. Michel, uh, Naib Michel Moussa. Ms. Carmen is saying that Dr. Michel Moussa talked about some political issues that prevented the ratification of the International Convention for the Protection. What is practically preventing the ratification and is the, um, the um, combating impunity, especially for those who are accused of crime of war in Lebanon, is also another reason for this. Dr. Michel, the question is addressed to you. Would you please answer this question? It seems that Dr. Michel Moussa is no longer with us. Ms. Carmen, we will we will send this question to Mr. Michel Moussa and uh, try to obtain his question and insert it in the special report for, uh, related to this uh, session. Now I would like to uh, welcome Mr. Bassam Al-Antar and uh, Bassam Al-Antar is the uh, person in charge of the international relations in the uh, Commission for the Missing and Forcibly Disappearance. He will give us uh, some uh, ideas about the challenges and obstacles faced by the, uh, by the National Commission for the Missing and Forcibly Disappeared in Lebanon and he will share his, his ideas in, or, in order to highlight the, um, the importance of activating the work of the National Committee in Lebanon. The floor is yours, Mr. Bassam. Good evening. And uh, I would like uh, first to salute all those who are present with us. And I would like to commend the work of uh, the Office of the Higher Commissioner for Human Rights in Lebanon for organizing uh, such uh, a conference. First, I would like to highlight uh, and briefly uh, three main issues, uh, given the lack of time and also I believe that uh, um, going into details requires a more um, a more uh, uh, in-depth uh, in-depth uh, session with uh, the uh, people concerned. As uh, to uh, the ratification of this convention, I believe that the uh, the issue uh, is first related to uh, this uh, non clarity of the situation in lebanon the government of lebanon has declared in its last revision of the convention that the previous uh, government and even the previous and previous cabinets uh, and especially the uh, the government of 2019 or uh, late 2018 has uh, succeeded in and uh, ratif or of having a decree on uh, ratif ratifying this uh, convention and this decree uh, and thank god we were able to have uh, this decree uh, to ratify this convention however the question is why why so the, uh, the, there was uh, there was a decree on the ratification of the convention on the disabled however the question here is related to why we didn't have a uh, another decree related to the ratification of the uh, the convention on the enforced disappearance that is why the ratification of uh, the uh, uh, the international convention for the protection of all persons from enforced disappearance and the problem resides in the 
the, the lack of clarity to the uh, party concerned in taking the first step towards the ratification. And if there is no, uh, we don't have a scenario that is uh, having the, the cabinet ratify the, um, the convention again. And if if the cabinet does not consider that this convention is a vital convention and an essential convention, I believe that that this convention won't be ratified. I believe that this is in the hand of the cabinet. Second, the uh, legal ratification and the legal uh, work of the commission and in parallel with all national uh, national independent commissions i believe that the challenges and difficulties are multilateral and uh, real there is one main uh, problem related to the uh, regular work of the uh, executive and this usually usually the executive requires a certain uh, time in order to achieve their work. For example, we have had three consecutive ministers of uh, justice that were not uh, able to, uh, to implement their work, and the scenario uh, 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 took place again, and it will take place again in, uh, in relation to the ratification of the International Convention, especially that uh, the late ministers did not really have uh, the political will to ratify this convention and this is related and this commission commission for the missing and forcibly disappeared that is under the ministry of justice should have the mandate in order to face all uh, challenges and obstacles and these obstacles are mainly related to the non uh, comprehension and here i am very aware of uh, uh, using this term is that the authorities, the administ administrative authorities do not really understand the concept of uh, the work of the independent commission, whether in terms of administration or finance or the, um, the, the laws in into force. That is why we will have further obstacles in terms of the activation of the work of these uh, commissions. In addition to that, there was no progress in the activation of the commission. It w there won't be any uh, any uh, any progress in the work of the commission for the missing and forcibly disappeared. And on a personal level, I tried more than one time to have an international coordination and a monthly coordination and even a weekly co uh, coordination in order to reach uh, results. And unfortunately, and for reasons uh, we don't know, I don't know, and but most of these are related to uh, to um, uh, to uh, uh, to several reasons. We would say that as a commission, we are concerned in the. Uh, uh, the coordination between the Commission for the Missing and Forcibly Disappeared in Lebanon and the International Committee uh, for a Commission for Human Rights and a Committee for the Disappeared and to intensify uh, the efforts in order to reach a result with the uh, present uh, uh, government before the uh, deadline for the next uh, um, uh, elections and in order to um, to have laws and to adopt laws that will help uh, activate these commissions and help implement the work of the, these commissions. There are many details, but in order to respect the time and in order to give the opportunity for others, I will uh, limit myself to these remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bassam, for your important uh, remarks. We will include your your uh, remarks and your intervention uh, in the uh, special report uh, and uh, related to this uh, webinar and we will submit uh, this uh, report to all uh, to the commission the national commission and, and the international commission another uh, um, another uh, uh, question addressed to Ms. Carmen or Mr. Juan and uh, Ms. Salma from the national commission and uh, group on enforce and involuntary uh, enforce on enforce and involuntary disappearance uh, accepted any complaint uh, from uh, NGOs, civil society organizations 
related to uh, individual cases on enforces appearance and what is the role of the committee in the case of uh, the working group on enforces appearance um, uh, acknowledge uh, acknowledge the act of uh, uh, enforce this appearance and ask or requested the state members uh, uh, to stop this violation. Ms. Carmen? Ms. Carmen? Um, Mr. Juan? Yes, um, of course, the working group can also receive uh, um, information on, a, on particular cases and can request information to the state on a specific cases until the convention is enforced for a given state. In this particular situation, Lebanon, the committee cannot receive individual complaints nor request for urgent actions, but the working group can do so. Um, and. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not really sure if I understood correctly the question. I don't know if this has to do with past enforced disappearances and how to address the, the past. Of course, the committee is also, uh, in, 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 in complying with its duties, interested in past situations. And although there is a provision in the treaty that states that the obligations of the state will take place from the moment of the ratification on, the committee requests information on the um, actions taken at the domestic level in order to address the past as well. We do so in the context of our uh, um, requests for information under Article 29, uh, meaning the follow-up on the report presented by the states. Uh, thank you, Mr. Juan, for your answer. We have also another question from Ms. Wadat Halawani. She is also a member of the National Commission on Enforces Appearance in Lebanon. She is asking about the impact of ratifying the convention on the cases of enforced disappearance. So basically she is asking, does, does the ratification process uh, impact you know, the, the percentage of uh, uh, enforced disappearance in a country? Do you have any, any information about this? At the moment, I do not have the statistical information. Of course, the fact that uh, international specific obligations on enforced disappearances are in place for a given state uh, could uh, translate in the state adopting national policies and amending the legislation in order to address the phenomenon. Um, so, of course, the, the, the numbers will go down by the mere fact that the state will start complying with the obligations under the convention, but I do not have statistical information. My colleague, uh, Melissa Kolakovic, uh, who will participate uh, in a few minutes, might have a statistical information due to the nature of the presentation that uh, she, she was going to, to, to uh, give to you. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Juan Pablo. Uh, شكراً كمان للسادة والسيدات الحاضرين معنا على الأسئلة والتفاعل القيمين جداً. Ladies and gentlemen, for your questions, now we will move to our second session of our uh, uh, session today on the effective and practical experiences in joining the International Convention for the Protection of All Persons from Enforced Disappearance. Now I will give the floor to Mr. Rida Abdelaziz. He is a regional expert in human rights and he's also uh, the uh, person in charge in the training on human rights in Egypt. Mr. Rida, the floor is yours. Please go ahead. Mr. Rida, you need to activate your mic, please. Good evening, can you hear me? Yes, please, uh, we can hear you clearly and we can see you. Mr. Rida, you have the floor. Thank you. I'm really happy to moderate the second session 
I have a few comments regarding uh, the cases of uh, enforced disappearance. Uh, I know that there is some political confusion uh, in Lebanon. Uh, however, uh, we need uh, to treat uh, this phenomena in general in Lebanon. I know that uh, you have institutional problems. Uh, I mean by that the institutions are competent in terms of uh, combating uh, enforced uh, disappearance, uh, but we need uh, to take uh, proactive actions in order uh, to uh, serve the interest of the victims. Uh, let's not forget uh, that uh, this is one of the most serious uh, offenses and violations of human rights. Uh, it does not only affect persons who are forcibly disappeared, it also affects all the community. So uh, I would like uh, to tell you that based on the first session, there is a political will. Uh, I sensed a political will uh, in the sense of dealing with this case, um, but uh, the uh, government uh, would like to have more information about the measures that can be taken. And I will start by giving this floor to Judge uh, Ayman Ahmed. Uh, uh, I would like him to comment uh, on uh, what uh, we have mentioned in the first session. The National Commission uh, does not have a budget. Their members have not been appointed yet. And there are really obstacles that need to be overcome. And uh, after that, I will be giving the floor to Judge Angela Dagher. Uh, uh, Your Honor, Judge Ayman Ahmed, uh, you have the floor. It's a common uh, intervention. Yes, it's a joint presentation. Good evening. Uh, thank you, Mr. Rida Abdulaziz. Uh, I would like to thank the Regional Office of the High uh, Commissioner for Human Rights. I would like to thank you for your efforts uh, you are deploying in uh, the field uh, of uh, coordinating efforts uh, with competent authority to combat uh, enforced uh, disappearance. Uh, I would like to answer a uh, few questions uh, that were addressed uh, to us. Uh, um, uh, we uh, were present with one of my colleagues uh, in the discussions that took place uh, regarding the adoption of a budget for the National Commission for the Missing and Forcibly Disappeared in Lebanon. And uh, the Ministry of Justice uh, approved uh, this uh, idea. Uh, however, the uh, salaries uh, of uh, the members of the National Commission could not be equal to uh, the salaries uh, of uh, the members of the Constitutional Council. This was the only reservation, but uh, within the um, uh, commission, we asked the Ministry of Finance uh, to provide a financial uh, opinion on how to adopt a budget for the commission that would be similar to the budget of uh, the uh, Constitutional Council. So uh, the uh, uh, whole topic is between the hands of the Ministry of Finance and not the Ministry of Justice. You know that uh, Lebanon is a democracy where all citizens are equal and where, ha where they have the right uh, to live. Uh, and uh, Lebanon has uh, uh, adhered uh, to the Universal Declaration on Human Rights and various uh, human rights instruments adopted by the United Nations. And we have uh, ratified uh, uh, major international conventions such as the Convention Against Torture, and the government uh, in 2007 uh, signed the Convention on the Protection of All Persons Against Enforced uh, Disappearance, and it was submitted to the Parliament uh, in 2007 for ratification. And uh, during the civil war, uh, we have suffered a lot. Uh, there were many violations against the life and freedom in order uh, to forget about this uh, harsh past, in order to overcome uh, those bad memories, and in order to build a community based on human rights uh, and mutual recognition, the parliament adopted uh, law number 105 in 2018. It's uh, the law uh, regarding uh, the missing and forcibly disappeared in Lebanon. And uh, 
we know that this law does not replace the convention. We hope that the ratification will happen soon after the end of the discussions. Uh, the uh, law number 005 uh, consecrated many rights um, uh, for the missing and forcibly disappeared persons and their families, including the right to reparation. And the National Commission for the, Mis for the Missing and Forcibly Disappeared uh, Persons in uh, Lebanon has been mandated um, uh, to search uh, for the disappeared persons uh, and uh, to search for the victims in order to release them again or repatriate their corpse. Uh, and uh, 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 we uh, provide support uh, to the families through this National Commission for the Missing and Forcibly Disappeared Person. And uh, this uh, National Commission really needs to start its work in order to do uh, justice uh, to the families of the victims. Regarding the challenges, um, uh, the uh, main uh, challenge that we are facing is uh, about uh, the membership of this commission. The Ministry of Justice, in cooperation uh, with uh, uh, the High Judicial Council, is uh, working in order to fill uh, this gap and uh, uh, appoint members of the National Commission. After the uh, nomination of the or designation of new members in the High Judicial Council, the Minister of, Judges, uh, of Justice uh, will actually uh, designate uh, various candidates for the National Commission and uh, the various authorities and stakeholders will, will recommend the various candidates upon the recommendation of the Minister of Justice. We also have other obstacles and challenges. Um, uh, the situation is really unstable in Lebanon. Uh, there is political instability as well as instability at the economic and social level. And uh, uh, the authorities uh, uh, might not uh, actually uh, respond uh, to the requests submitted to them by the National Commission. According to law number 105, uh, the National Commission has the right to ask for information and documents from the competent authorities in Lebanon as well as from uh, foreign authorities. Uh, and um, it's really important to overcome this challenge. Uh, sometimes uh, the foreign authorities are not responding to our requests. This could lead uh, to hindering the work of the Commission and uh, we will not be able to reach uh, the uh, fruitful results we would like to reach uh, and we need to take measures that uh, would make it binding for uh, foreign authorities uh, to cooperate with us. Uh, uh, we know that uh, the uh, time that elapsed since the, end of, since the end of the civil war uh, constitutes uh, another obstacle because we don't have uh, sufficient sufficient databases, we don't have sufficient data, and we don't really have enough information about the missing and forcibly disappeared persons. However, in spite of these obstacles, the Ministry of Justice, within its mandate, is willing and always willing to overcome those uh, difficulties because uh, it uh, gives uh, paramount importance uh, to the case of the missing and forcibly disappeared persons. The Ministry of Justice uh, uh, was represented uh, in all parliamentary commissions and they submitted their comments and they participated in many workshops and round tables. They cooperate with various uh, public uh, authorities and uh, the organizations of the civil society in order uh, to apply the law. Thank you. Mr. Rida, your mic, please. Can you hear me now? Yes. I would like to thank uh, Judge uh, Ayman Ahmad, the representative of the Ministry of Justice. Uh, Mr. Rida, can you please activate your mic? Can you unmute your mic? We cannot hear you, says the interpreter and the speaker. I guess we have lost Mr. Rida. Rida, you have, Mr. Rida, you have the floor. One minute, please.
Mrs. Lin, can you hear me now? Yes, Mr. Rida. Yes, I was saying uh, I would like uh, to thank Judge uh, Angela Daher and Judge Ayman Ahmed. And uh, we have heard the statement of the Ministry of Justice. The Ministry of Justice um, uh, is trying to fill the gap uh, in terms of the membership of the National Commission. I believe that this is a good progress. Uh, I believe that the Commission uh, will be able uh, to reinitiate its work, uh, especially when the budget will be completed and will be uh, allocated uh, to the Commission and when they will have offices to work uh, from within. This is a really good step forward. Uh, now, uh, I would like like uh, to give the floor to Mrs. Milica Kolakovic, Vice President uh, of the United Nations Committee on Enforced uh, Disappearances. Uh, I believe that she will be talking about successful experiences from the world and the region in ratifying the International Convention and what are the best practices in cooperation with the relevant United Nations uh, Committee for uh, Lebanon and uh, for the whole Arab region. You have the floor, ma'am. Thank you. Hear me? Yes. yes, yes, please. Great. Great. Your Excellencies and dear colleagues, uh, of course, I'm grateful for this opportunity to take part in this webinar. And let me briefly introduce myself. Uh, as you already heard, my name is Milica Kolakovic Bojovic, and I'm a member of the committee since 2017. And so, so, since 2019, I'm also the vice president of the committee. And yes, today I will try to um, raise uh, several issues relevant for the positive experience of the committee. Uh, and since we are running out of time, I will try to speak briefly. The first of all, I would like to share with you my impression that when we are talking about ratification, somehow we are talk mostly about the processes and we are talk mostly about additional obligations to the state party, mostly related to legislative interventions and to additional workload related to reporting. But somehow uh, I have impression that we are missing the key issue, the main message. And the key issue when it comes to ratification is to make an uh, impact in reality. And we are talking when we are talking about the ratification of the International Convention for the Protection of All Persons uh, from Enforced Disappearances. Uh, I believe that our main goal should be to make an impact on victims. Uh, so you already heard that committee has recently celebrated its 10th anniversary, and so far uh, our practice uh, has shown that the ratification of the convention and the consequent activities of the committee aimed at efficient implementation of the convention in a state party uh, can result actually in the significant and tangible impact on victims of enforced disappearances in that state party. Uh, as previous speakers, uh, mostly uh, Mr. Juan Pablo Alban uh, explained, the main activities of the committee in terms of overseeing uh, of the implementation of the convention goes through the several parallel tracks, namely through the reviewing of the state parties reports and follow ups in order to define concluding observations and to provide clear recommendations uh, to the state parties on how to improve their legislation and their practices in parallel there is a urgent actions procedure. Also, there is a procedure of the individual uh, and interstate communications. And also, there is an important part of the committee's work related to the adoption of the general comments and various guidelines directed to support the state parties to implement some provisions of the convention or even uh, aimed at improvement uh, of the implementation of all provisions of the convention, but when enforced disappearances uh, occur in some specific contexts. So, uh, if we are aware of all of these parallel tracks, uh, I would like to raise your uh, your attention to the few examples of a good practices directly influenced by the committee's work. Uh, the first of all, in the, more than several state parties, a comprehensive legislative changes have been made to follow committee's recommendations. Uh, 
A good examples of that could be, for example, Mexico or recently Spain. Uh, during the 21st session of the committee held a month ago, uh, a committee has adopted uh, its report on the follow-up actions implemented uh, by Spain uh, to follow, to implement uh, recommendations of the committee. And uh, by this occasion, uh, committee uh, acknowledged, committee concluded uh, that the Spain uh, has made uh, great steps uh, in order to follow uh, follow up uh, recommendations of the committee and prepare the adoption of the uh, Act Number no. Four uh, from 2015 uh, on the status of victims of crime. So the intention of the states was to follow. Uh, the committee's recommendation to prepare the comprehensive uh, policy to deal with the rights of the victims of informed disappearances. But also, it might be interesting for you to know that sometimes um, the trigger uh, for such a decision of the state to uh, adopt a comprehensive policy is not based only on the recommendations from the concluding observations. Uh, for example, my state, Serbia, was triggered by the adoption of the guiding principles for search adopted in 2019. So my government made decision to prepare for adoption a new law on missing persons as a comprehensive policy to address search for missing persons, step-by-step -step procedure and coordination, but also to ensure support to the victims uh, and their family members. In addition to legislative changes, a great impact has been made through the urgent actions procedure, which resulted in uh, locating uh, disappeared persons. Uh, for example, uh, someone asked about statistics. So far, 107 persons have been located and uh, 83 of them have been located alive based on the urgent actions procedure. And I believe that this data don't require additional explanation since it's not only about more than 100 uh, direct victims of enforced disappearances, it's about basically uh, a few thousand of their family members, relatives and close persons who suffered from enforced disappearances of their loved ones. Uh, also, uh, now we are hoping, uh, hoping to be able uh, soon to close uh, the urgent actions uh, concerning uh, recent uh, protests in Cuba and Colombia, and in that case, this number of uh, 107 is going to be uh, much bigger. When it comes to the urgent action procedure, I would like also to mention uh, the recent decision of the Mexican Supreme Court to declare the binding character of urgent actions, uh, namely on June 16 this year, uh, the Supreme Court made the decision in which uh, it stated that uh, CD, urgent actions, have a binding character for all authorities of the state party. Uh, the case, this case was submitted by uh, an NGO, uh, IDEAS, uh, that has presented uh, many urgent actions to the committee, and they did so on behalf of the disappeared persons and uh, disappeared person and his mother, uh, after state authorities told the mother that they uh, did not have any obligations to take uh, into account CED recommendations. So, if you Consider the fact that in the moment of ren rendering that decision of the Supreme Court, there were more than uh, 450 cases of urgent actions of missing persons ordered to the Mexican state. It's clear that such a decision is going to have a significant impact on victims and their families in Mexico. Namely, uh, this decision is... Uh, an important step to uh, recognize uh, victims of uh, enforced disappearances and to recognize their right to be searched and to reiterate state's obligation to act with due diligence, Q, 
carrying out all actions necessary for searching a missing person since the first moment uh, disappearance is reported. Uh, so in this context, it might be interesting for you to know uh, about statistics from the region. Currently, uh, there are five urgent actions on Morocco. Uh, one referring to Oman and one referring to Tunisia. And also it's important to mention that states, states have responded to all of these requests. And uh, also sometimes uh, urgent actions mechanisms uh, resulted uh, in uh, establishing uh, international cooperation, for example, following a uh, recommendation to a state party uh, in one case uh, of urgent actions related to Honduras, uh, international cooperation between Honduras and uh, other state parties have been established in order to act upon requests uh, of the committee. And finally, uh, there is also important mechanism of the committee to make a real impact. Uh, this is a procedure related to the protection of the NGO activists and the members of associations of family members of missing persons. Related to excuse. Us, but um, we're running out of time. We're sorry, but we're trying to be briefer. Sentence to conclude. Yeah. Conclude, yes, please. Yeah. Uh, I just want uh, to mention the uh, procedure of the committee to protect uh, NGO activists and the family members of the associations of the family members of missing persons from the reprisals or intimidations. Uh, uh, after their decision to address the committee on enforced disappearances. Thank you for your for your attention. Uh, many thanks, Ms. Melissa, for this valuable. Thank you for your experience and expertise in the different contexts that you mentioned. At this point, uh, we will be listening to the intervention of uh, Mrs. Amina Abu Ayash from Morocco. Uh, Mrs. Amina Abu Ayash, President of the National Council for Human Rights in the Kingdom of, um, of Morocco, which has a, a wide experience in dealing with human rights. And we uh, want to make sure that we listen to the different experiences to relate um, the context in which we can deal with uh, forced disappearances. Um, th first of all, good evening, everyone. Ladies and gentlemen, first of all, we'd like to congratulate... Um, we would like to congratulate the head of the regional uh, bureau. Hello, Ruwaida, how are you? Uh, first of all, to, to support uh, the, the families of the disappeared and to the NGOs who work on this matter in order to reach a stage where the Convention on Disappeared People is ratified. So first of all, I'm very happy and uh, I'm very happy as long as with my team from Rabat to be with you today. And, uh, we were not able to follow from the beginning of the session, but um, Actually, my team was able to follow, and they will be uh, following up as well uh, later on on the different problems and challenges and points that were tackled during this session. Um, no doubt that uh, the head of the committee has mentioned the importance of this uh, convention. This convention has, has known a long history when it comes to uh, putting and ratifying and uh, all the all the stages that were related to this uh, convention, uh, although we haven't really reached the half the number of the states that would ratify on this convention. Even last year, a lot of NGOs were speaking about this convention. When it comes to the experience of Morocco, I can say that 
when it comes to the experience of Morocco, we can actually uh, combine my experience as an activist in an, in an NGO and uh, what I know has been done to move on with the ratification of the convention, but also to move on with the issues of um, forced disappearance in Morocco. As you all know, Morocco has been among the three countries that worked on raising and promoting this convention, and they still do. And Morocco, Argentina and Morocco, each year, they uh, raise a decision for the UN Sec uh, Secretary General and, and the General Assembly to, uh, to actually promote this uh, convention. In Morocco, when it comes to forced disappearance, this issue has known different stages and steps and linkages uh, with political issues and um, political conditions and situations and uh, coups uh, and attempts of military coups in Morocco. The... The council, the Human Rights Council in uh, Morocco, that is known uh, the National Council for Human Rights in Morocco, that was developed in the last uh, years, in 1991 has formed a specific committee to uh, work on different issues, especially on the violations uh, of human rights, uh, including the issue of forced disappearances and enforced disappearances. During the same uh, stage and at the same period, uh, we also launched a lot of NGOs and active people from different political parties on the national level or journalists or academics um, and university professors, we all uh, launched uh, together what could be called the national path um, to move forward into ratifying the Convention on Enforced Disappearance. So all these groups worked closely and extensively together for years and years. And I still remember, and I'm uh, responsible in uh, the Moroccan um, Association for Human Rights, that I was actually responsible for the first political file on enforced disappearances. And we actually submitted some of the names that we were able to reach. It was uh, one way to reach and communicate with the families of the disappeared, especially that uh, such families were not really present on the, on the political scene or the uh, social scene through political parties or through any groups. So since that moment, we started connecting with the families of the disappeared and of the uh, victims of uh, forced disappearance and enforced disappearance. And we were very uh, active when it comes to dealing with political parties and, and on, on the media to move on with the ratification of the convention and to work more on making the issue of uh, enforced disappearance of high importance and to put it on the agendas of the policy makers and to the relevant people. And then we had uh, the, the committee that was formed and we wanted to, uh, to, to actually uh, pay uh, for the families of the disappeared, whether they were killed or they stayed alive. And uh, regardless of the reason behind their disappearance, be it that they were disappeared because of the uh, state apparatus in Morocco or not. So uh, we wanted to provide them um, with a redemption. And we linked this mission of working on uh, enforced disappearance and, and finding the truth and finding the reasons behind such disappearance. And to also know and discover the places where such place where such people were disappeared. So we worked on um, on the media on uh, promoting the testimonies of the people that were released after being disappeared and after being missing. 
1991. And such testimonies from uh, from people who were exposed to forced disappearance helped uh, widely in having more people work on the issue on such issues or to work on uh, in general on uh, human rights violations issues and this is the occasion that uh, allowed us at the time to to actually find more information on enforced disappearance and to refine our ways and tools and uh, symbols and uh, ways of dealing uh, with this issue to promote further studies on the issue of enforced disappearance. In 1991, there was a consensus, a political consensus uh, and democratic consensus in, in Morocco. And uh, such a context allowed us to work more on the issue of uh, enforced disappearance and to know how to actually launch it, how to actually work on it during the democratic transition. And this was a very important uh, occasion for the participation and engagement of um, government officials in this issue. And this is something that um, the Moroccan Organization on Human Rights was very active on. They worked actively to put an end to human rights violations. And, and their efforts actually led uh, to the birth of uh, the Council of uh, the um, Human Rights Council uh, in, in, in Morocco. And uh, we uh, chose the national organization at the time because we wanted to, we really knew that if we want to find a committee, if we want to uh, establish a committee to find the truth, such a committee needs to be established by, uh, by uh, the acceptance of the Moroccan state. And this is when the national uh, organization used was the National Council for Human Rights in the Kingdom of Morocco that was coordinating uh, with other NGOs. And we were coordinating with its uh, members, with its president, and um, we we're checking the recommendations that they uh, have raised to the General Assembly and to, to the uh, King of Morocco. And based on that, in 2004, we had, uh, uh, we had a committee established for reconciliation and for compensation, of, uh, uh, for compensation for the families of the missing and the disappeared. But the most important thing is to actually find out the truth and to uh, equip the prisons and to equip the different... Uh, uh, infrastructures and to provide much more policy recommendations and programmatic uh, recommendations for the state and for the, for the different relevant bodies which were actually incorporated in the, um, uh, in the, in the new uh, constitutional uh, uh, um, amendments of Morocco. So we can see that uh, the committees did actually abide by uh, the international standards for the protection of the enforceably disappeared persons. Though we, we saw that uh, the efforts really were reaching, uh, were reaching all the committees, especially the Reconciliation Committee. So the spirit of uh, cooperation was there between and the two uh, mechanisms that we were using, especially the transitional justice. We were trying to rely on the mechanism of transitional justice because we, we wanted to put an end for that. So the Committee for Reconciliation worked on compensating the families and to analyze the, 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 the policies that allowed for such breaches of human rights to happen. And they presented new recommendations to move on with the Convention with the Human Rights. So the main uh, aim was to move on with 
the right to life. And during that period, in 1991, and even before the, uh, the con before the Committee for Reconciliation, around 400 disappeared were released and they were still alive. And by that, Morocco was the first country to release 400 disappeared persons after they were disappeared and f they were missing and they were found alive afterwards. So I think uh, we can say that the committee was able to find out the truth about the destiny of the, of the disappeared people more than 9,000 persons were able to benefit from the medical card, and medical benefits. They were able to benefit from social uh, services. And especially a lot of people were kicked off uh, the, from, their, uh, from their work for some uh, political reasons and for, for uh, reasons related to uh, the chaos happening in the country. So the work of this committee was not only limited to uh, providing compensations and uh, finding out the truth and documenting what happened, but also it transcended to what is medical and social uh, services and to reconsider uh, the moral aspect and, and moral compensation for those who were uh, disappeared and missing and especially those that were not in the age of employment they were able to get back their employment opportunities so this committee was able to uh, raise recommendations on uh, the the age uh, for for employment so they had specific recommendations policy recommendations on the age of employment so this uh, committee provided great recommendations that are uh, some kind of references for us to date on guaranteeing the right to life, the right to, a hum to uh, being able to guarantee human rights for everyone. And most importantly, to criminalize first enforced disappearance, to criminalize torture, to criminalize anything that is against human rights, to criminalize the conditions that uh, lead to human rights violations and to criminalize hate speech, discrimination, racism, which are all points that are enshrined in the constitution of the Kingdom of Morocco and that were adopted in uh, the criminal uh, uh, law of uh, the uh, Kingdom of Morocco and of the recommendations related to it. So there was a national strategy on impunity that was also set forth. Please allow me, Mrs. Uh, I am really interested in the experience of the Kingdom of Morocco and uh, we, we, we never get enough from listening to uh, to the experience of the Kingdom of Morocco. I really thank you a lot and I'd like to uh, conclude what you just mentioned, that there's a need to focus on partnering with different uh, bodies, including the media, to, uh, pressure on, uh, to pressure towards the ratification of the convention and uh, to work more with the families of uh, the uh, victims of enforced disappearance. We're looking at this transitionally f transition phase in Morocco and looking into the issues of enforced disappearance, we can say that this is a really prompt experience. And I would tell Sela Sarian since we run out of time, we will take only three questions. And once again, we will we reassure you that all discussions and questions and answers will be included in the report that will be sent to all participants. So uh, let's take the first question now. We have one, two and three questions so far.
Your Excellency the Judge, there are no questions. So if there are no more questions, we would like to thank all participants. Thank you very much for those, for all participants and all speakers and all colleagues. We would like to salute our colleagues from Morocco and Egypt and all other countries. And I would like to thank all judges and Dr. Michel Moussa and all members of the uh, National Committee and International Commission. Thank you very much. And uh, 